President Muhammad Buhari on Friday presented a 2023 budget proposal to a joint session of the National Assembly. The over 20 trillion naira proposal, according to the president, is aimed at consolidating and completing ongoing legacy projects by the present administration. But a major concern to the attainment of the revenue projection of government are the twin issues of insecurity and massive oil theft. Well, both the executive and legislature agree that the matter is now out of hand with a reported 1 million barrels of crude unaccounted for daily in Nigeria. Her reactions have been trailing this and how government intends to address this issue and the subsidy challenge. Well, some senators speak on the matter. Uh, some of the parameters, 3% growth and so on, um, I thought were a bit ambitious. Given the, the lower revenues that we have, I think that it was a budget that was just trying to manage the situation. It's a good budget and I'm quite excited. And uh, we shouldn't be looking at things uh, the negative. We, uh, we should be you know, raising our bars and also trying to get the um, country on a good footage. The budget is okay. We have discussed this budget and I, I believe it will be of uh, benefit to the Nigerians. This particular budget should be a budget that bridges the gap in terms of um, you know, the crisis that is rocking our economy. I think um, um, we should focus on the area that will address all these um, inadequacies. Okay, for more of the 2023 budget, we're now being joined by Dr. Tokbe Fashua, an economist, and Professor Bungo Adi, a professor of economics at the Lagos Business School. Gentlemen, very warm welcome to you and uh, on news night. I mean, the budget issue is still reverberating and will continue to uh, up until December. But let me start with uh, Fashua here in the studios. Um, tell us, I mean, this budget, according to the president, is hinged on reconstruction or rehabilitation or completion, consolidation of infrastructural development. How would you say the 2022 budget fared in that area to now, for the president, to now start talking of consolidation infrastructurally? Talk back. Well, um, the best the president can do or the administration can do is to try and consolidate on everything they've done so far and the successes they've, uh, they've achieved, you know, um, the few successes, if you may. Um, the, the administration hasn't been particularly very uh, lucky as well. Of course, we know issues that surround maybe corruption, inefficiencies here and there and so on. Uh, actually, starting from the beginning in 2015, by 2016, crude oil prices went down and uh, we went into a recession. Then COVID came in 2020, we went into another recession. So it's quite remarkable that um, you know, we would have gone into recession twice in one administration. So the best they can do is to try and consolidate and say, okay, what can we rescue uh, going forward? The government, uh, the administration prides itself for some of the infrastructural development uh, that they've managed to achieve, you know, even though some of them are also still a bit problematic. For example, roads have been made in some places, but uh, security is not letting people actually appreciate some of those. Equally for rail as well, that's another problem, you know. So at, at best, what they can do now is to consolidate and try and transition into the next um, administration as much as possible. It hasn't been an easy ride. Um, you know, the hopes and dreams of the administration as well as people haven't quite been met, you know. But uh, perhaps, like they say, once there's life, there's hope. However, I think it's important to also say, for example, I had one senator saying that 3% um, growth is ambitious. Hey, come on. Uh, if, if in a country where population is growing by 2.6% and we have inflation at 20.52%, I mean, you know, I think um, we should very much, we should try and not 
um, capitulate to mediocrity, where 3% of, of growth, of GDP growth, becomes a big issue. And, um, you know, rather than we should be shooting for double digit growth at every point in time and putting everything on the table. And of course, that will include cutting um, unnecessary expenditure, making mm -hmm. sure we have good value for money in public spending, and also going after, you know, the revenue. I mean, uh, that said, same senator said, oh, well, our revenue is low because people don't want to pay, and especially the elite. You know, when you say come and pay property taxes, for example, they go daggers drawn, you know, so where, where's the money going to come from um, if we are always resisting and at the end right. of the day we're pulling our country down well um talk where you've actually led the conversation to where i needed to go honestly so i'd have to say thank you for that but professor adi let me bring you into this conversation right now and of course the main concerns that most analysts like yourself have gotten concerning this budget it's funding Let's not forget Nigeria right now as it stands. The government says we don't necessarily have, you know, um, a borrowing issue, but instead we have a revenue issue. But at the end of the day, how do you see the government's plans of funding this budget? And some say maybe even some borrowing might be added to already 41.16 trillion, according to the DMO, funding of this budget. is definitely going to pose uh, serious difficulties and in fact complexities for this government um, you know compared to uh, last year 2022 so we have a deficit budget of uh, almost 69 percent so um, meaning that uh, we're you know so 2022 we had six trillion and now we're talking about a deficit of more than 10 trillion naira that's that's huge so and then what are the plans? Of course, um, I, I like the, uh, the fact that uh, Tope has already raised the issue of uh, revenue issues. So government is constrained when it comes to revenue. So uh, last time, um, it, uh, the government resorted to borrowing to even uh, finance the budget, even to service debts. And because uh, when we look at the expenditure, actually the bulk of it, 75% rise in, uh, in uh, debt service. That's huge. So, and um, okay, this evening as well, uh, government is planning to uh, task the BPE to to finance uh, some part of the deficit, which means uh, we have to see some kind of uh, you know uh, an, an, an an effort towards um, asset stripping. I mean, not asset stripping, but selling off of uh, many government. Um, assets as a way to raise the revenue to finance the budget. I, I think these are some of the measures, but will there be sufficient? Um, not, not at all. I think there are some issues that we have to be looking at. Um, we are looking at the global economy at this point in time. Yes, this government has been quite unlucky. In 2016, we had a recession. Then in 2020, uh, we had COVID. And then uh, this issue of oil theft. So we have the global transmission um, of uh, the, the bad effects that are coming in. And then we have our own domestic issues, insecurity and, of course, theft and uh, vandalism and, uh, I mean, um, oil, oil theft. So um, these are big issues that we need to be looking at. Then um, the global economy will have inflation and then we have this huge debt. Um, some countries are already defaulting on their sovereign uh, obligations. Uh, we have so many countries are running into difficulties. Even Ghana, our neighbor, is into that. So we don't want to find ourselves where that will be a situation that we'll be facing. Because if uh, the way it is right now, uh, going by presidents, uh, going by what happened uh, in the, with the last budget where the government has to borrow money if we have to embark on fresh borrowing, then that's going to really uh, worsen the situation, the fiscal situation. The budget is called out of fiscal uh, sustainability uh, and transition, but uh, I, I can't see where that sustainability is coming when you have um, an increase in budget uh, deficit and then you have a drop in revenue because the bulk of our revenue is coming from oil. And then compared to 2022, that has uh, dropped uh, by 43%. And, and that's huge. So how are we trying? To, how are we going to, uh, you know, mitigate this gap? It's going to. Be, it's not going to be easy. And I'm not sure tax it will, will come to the rescue. Um, it, so a lot of issues. And then uh, what? What's, what? How is going? How, what's? I mean, how do we ensure 
or how are we sure that government can meet its uh, target of growth when the government is also challenged by a whole lot of number of issues we have flooding uh, ongoing and my heart goes out to the people who lost their their, their lives in in Casina and in in Anambra uh, just today so that is part of the problem that affects again the the budget uh, ta targets uh, we have insecurity we have this um, um, you know oil, oil theft so if we do not arrest that um, I don't see how possible it will be to reach our targets and then how to grow the revenue yeah. Uh, that would be a very tough one for us. Yes, um, that, that, that uh, you're spot on there, uh, Professor uh, Bongo Adi. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Dr. Tokbe uh, Faswa, how, when you look at just uh, from what uh, Bongo has enumerated, the 2022 budget is being, you know, beset with a lot, 1,001 problems, and those problems are still recurring. That's why I was say having deficit of over 69 percent. We're still going a borrowing, and well, and some of the people say they cannot really feel, you know, what uh, the uh, money is plunged into developmentally. But tell us how. Would you see this 2020, uh, 2023 budget uh, performance? Do you see it as meeting its targets with all the bottlenecks of crude oil theft, of insecurity? Well, that is fading away gradually, and we hope that farmers will go back, uh, yeah, you know, to the we fields. Hope, we, hope, we, we really yeah. hope the insecurity is fading out <laughs> away because, for example, um, you know that um, when you look at inflation at 20.52%, uh, and, you know, food inflation alone is 23%. Food inflation is always driving, uh, you know, our inflation in this country because, again, for everybody that earns money, the first thing you do is to buy food, all right? So if, because of security, farmers are not going to farm, uh, then you have a big problem on your hand. And so we're really very much hoping that this security issue will be fixed. Um, it's been very confounding for government. Remember that um, uh, President Buhari came in in 2015 under the idea that he was going to solve the security problem as a former general and so on. So, however, things didn't quite go that way. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate, um, you know, and um, uh, whatever could confound the, f confound the former general, confound all the our entire intelligentsia and military apparatus and, you know, uh, uh, what have you, then, then, I mean, I don't know whatever else we could do. I, I somehow believe, though, that um, just as this problem crept, crept in on us, uh, one day it's going to just disappear as well, you know, because usually there'll be fifth columnies, all sorts of conspiracies and stuff going on to have brought us to this point. Equally, um, it's very unfortunate that we, we started having this oil theft on a large scale. Some of the um, investors um, who bought onshore assets, for example, um, reported that they are losing about 90% of what they got. <laughs> so when you, when, you, when you have an oil well and, uh, and you are piping out this, this, this crude oil and you, know, you send out 100,000 barrels and you are getting only 1,500 barrels at the other end, you know you are in serious trouble. Um, and that's why the international oil companies, a lot of them have moved the deep sea. They've moved, some of them have moved Offshore. to deep sea, you yeah, know, very, deep, very far. Deep waters, such yeah. that, you know, before you mm. get to them there, you know, and then they're also, you know, they're doing a lot of very uh, deep drilling as well. You know, sometimes two kilometers into the, into the, into the earth the crust and so on. Yeah, yeah it's, it's incredible. Now, now, but I want to say very quickly that the real problem with our budget, whether 2023, 2022, I was in, the one of the budget presentations in, in, in Ministry of Finance. And, you know, when you put that assumption that came up earlier, you know, the key assumption of our budget is 1.69 million barrels per day at how much? At, at $70 a day. This gives the impression that the entire 1.6 million barrels is coming to Nigeria to use. No, it is very wrong. And I told the minister then, and they took it on board, but I know that changing uh, things in government is like a trailer trying to make a U-turn in a cul-de-sac. You know, but the point is this. This gives, the, you, you cannot blame any Nigerian now who brings out the calculator, say oh, 1.6 million times 70 times 365. Wow. 
five. But the point is that what comes to Nigeria out of this is only 30%. According to the Naiti, most of it belongs to the International Law Conference. Even that 30%, very, very uh, there's still a lot of challenge. Let's not forget that we've exactly. lost our number one position as the biggest oil in, in, producer in Africa, in Africa yeah. to Angola here. But talk about fashion, I want to stay with you. Since we're talking about budget deficit, it's a major challenge. If you look down back in the last seven years, especially looking at Buhari's administration, the budget deficit has hit over 30.58 trillion. If you look at, you know, uh -huh. per mm -hmm. quarter and all of that. But mm. at the end of the day, solutions is what we're looking at. Moving forward, what should we be doing to address the deficit before it See, comes okay. to us all? Okay, what I'll say very quickly um, the, is that uh, number one, I throw away the idea. Some people will say, oh, why don't you reduce the budget? Listen, we have mouths to take care of. 210 million Nigerians, 20 million children on the streets, according to UNESCO and what have you. Look, if we had times 10 the budget we have now, we would still be struggling to make sure that our people are comfortable. And, you know, population is not a disadvantage if you can make use of your population. In China today, 1.4 billion people, or maybe 1.5 billion people, when export-led growth slowed down and COVID came in and slowed, you know, slowed down the growth to almost negative, they had to focus inward and start saying, listen, let's produce things for our people. Nigeria at 210 million people should not be a disadvantage. You should be thinking about what can we do to make sure we produce things for our people. And look, all of those things like illiteracy, children out of school, and poverty, you know, lack of housing, they are, they are advantages in a way because there are things that we can focus our energy on. There's work for us to do. There's a lot of work for us to do. So when you talk about deficit, the thing is this, you know, there's this very clever thing that government people do, and I hope we change one day, of always comparing everything with GDP, all right? So we say, oh, our, our, our budget deficit is only 4% of GDP. I mean, it makes no meaning. What you, in, 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 the, in the practice of budgeting, and I'm a chartered accountant, as you know, and I've done budgeting in several spheres before, you know, and, you know, in the field of uh, in, 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 in the field of budgeting, what you should do is to compare your deficit with that budget itself. So it's like it, the father of a household, you are any one million naira per annum, but you are spending 1.6 million naira every every year. You have a problem. It is 60 percent of your earnings that you are having to go and borrow. Not 60 percent of your total asset, and, and whereas GDP is a bad comparison for the total asset of a country, GDP is just the work that me and you that we do, the money that we earn for our services and goods added together. The government is not going to come and collect from us to pay his debt or to do anything. So, you know what they should do when countries do deficit budgeting? After a while, countries are put under pressure to also balance the budget, and even where you can, you also have surplus budgeting. But what we have seen, especially um, since 2015, we've seen. A, a kind of habit, a very bad habit of, you know, having huge deficits. 30%, it started around 30%, 40%. Now we're looking at, in or fact, the initial, the initial, the uh, initial, well, no, no, I don't think it's, no, I, mean, I think Dr. Professor Bongo was talking about last year's budget. Now, in this year's budget, the initial uh, MTEF that they released was that they were going to budget 19 trillion, but 12 trillion was going to be deficit. And that would have been 63% of the budget. But in the budget that uh, President Buhari laid, of course, which will still be discussed by Senate and also harmonized and all of that stuff, in this very budget, they've now increased to 20, 20 trillion, okay? But the deficit will be 10 point something trillion, which is almost 52, 53%. I hope they are getting it because I wrote on this thing as well. You don't do reckless budget like that because when you're doing consistent deficit budgeting, what it means is that you are basically acquiring debt for children yet unborn. And of course, many of the debt that we're taking, value for money is still an issue. So whereas you can say it's good to borrow, uh, it depends on what you're using it for. But when you're borrowing 100 million and only 50 million out of it is actually getting to the thing you're doing and the rest just dissipates in corruption and what have you, then you have a huge problem. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tokwe Fasuadia. Let me come to you, Professor Bongo. Do you think that this budget is capable of addressing the present inflationary rates in the country, the deficit that has become so humongous, deficit and uh, debt servicing bigger than capital projects or the budget for uh, capital expenditure. How capable will this budget redress and truly consolidate on the little or on some of the infrastructural development of this administration? 
Well, if you look at the capital expenditure, it's actually dropped by 2%. Um, you know, so the only th new thing, uh, thing that we can see is the infra code has been cr uh, created, which is the $1 trillion you know, dollar, uh, infrastructure fund. Uh, so that is the only addition, but in terms of size, it's dropped against uh, last time. Now, um, is, it, is, is the budget capable of uh, putting, you know, reducing inflation or, put, uh, increase or enhancing the purchasing power? That's what it means. Um, I, I cannot say that because if you look at the history, so let's look at the past seven years. Uh, this is the eighth budget of this administration. So in the past seven years, uh, the budget has managed to achieve um, an average of 2% growth. And then we have seen inflation that has been increasing from 2015 up to this point. So if history were to be a good guide, then we expect that you know um, this budget will not do uh, any any will not be of any help in curbing this uh, rampaging inflation that is going all over the world. Of course, I'm not blaming the government. Uh, this is uh, part of the inflation is imported, but of course we've seen the inflation hedging up as a result of insecurity, uh, which has reduced uh, food food production, food security, as uh, Dr. Tope mentioned earlier. Uh, okay, so uh, because the bulk of uh, the you know, headline inflation is usually driven by mainly by the food component. So that's the challenge that we have. Now, inflation is rampaging everywhere in the world. Um, what I had expected is that uh, we've been looking at how to boost consumer spending because that's what one of the things that will help to you know, maybe reduce inflation or increase the purchasing power. Now, uh, subsidy is an issue. Uh, the government, of course, for because over the years we've seen that government, this particular administration is one that has a, a certain kind of populist or socialist bent, if I may say that, uh, and has been not, you know, been kind of cowardly when it comes to taking the hard decisions of uh, removing the fuel subsidy. And then when you talk about this deficit, you cannot have a, a, a deficit of almost 70 percent and expect that your inflation will reduce because you have to go to look for money, you have to borrow. And when you have huge deficit, it's going to rub off on your inflationary trend. So we're going to have high, higher inflation given where we are. So there is no way of escaping it, except that we now try to, you know, reduce. I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Go ahead. Wrap it up. As we Wrap it up quickly, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so I, sure. So I, I think that we have to think, you know, be creative with, uh, with subsidy. Subsidy has to go. And then if that subsidy goes, so we need to have some kind of compensating uh, variation to, 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 the, to the consumers, to, to workers, for instance. We can do some kind of tax repair to, for, for workers and then find a way to support the low-income group, the 100 million Nigerians who live below the uh, poverty line. So that way Professor, it's possible for Nigeria to cushion the effect of that poverty. Right. Yeah. So cushioning the effect is quite important because at the end of the day, let's not forget, uh, the world is actually suffering. The economy, global inflationary issue as it stands right now, because even countries that have never had a recession in the last couple of decades were seeing that happen. But Fashua, let me come to you real quick right now. Let's not forget, this is the last budget that President Muhammad Buhari will be presenting to the National Assembly. Let's, you know, take a look back a little bit. What are some of the legacies, the highs, and maybe some lows you, you have seen as an expert as it concerns, you know, his administration and its legacies as it concerns budgets? Indeed. Oh, that's a great question because I, um, if you look at some of my writings in the past, I've always pushed for, listen, like, you know, we need to have bigger budgets and so on. And when you convert our budgets back to, to U.S. dollar, and of course, let's say that a dollar is a dollar anywhere, you know, you find out that budget per capita is really small. I mean, we're budgeting about $140 for per person in Nigeria, um, when even in places like Angola that you mentioned earlier, their budget per capita is about 2800 per person. In places like Algeria, it's about $2,000. In Egypt, uh, about $800. I did that analysis uh, some time back when I was running for president and so on. You know, and then when you go to Europe, you'll be seeing budget per capita about $20,000. In the U.S., about $25,000. Meaning that that is what the government, the federal government is budgeting for everything per person, whether we're talking about the security, education, you know, agriculture, what have you, everything across the board. So I think that this government, and of course, the other time I had um, a, a small chat with uh, Mr. Ben Akabu,
Agbeze. You know, I think they're taking on board um, the fact that these budgets are really small and we need to work harder to ensure that whatever the case may be, you know, we deliver for the people. So that's a plus on the budgeting side for the, co for the, for the government. And apart from that, you could also add to that that, listen, this government, as you know, they, they want to go out as a government that has put in place some, some, some infrastructures, even things like Lekki Deep Seaport, and that I understand will come up very shortly, Dangote Refinery. They're going to add all of that. And look, you can't blame them. That's what it is. The policies of a government causes businesses to come on board and all of that. You know? However, I would wish that the, the government, the administration, does a lot more in the security area to ensure that uh, this country is a bit safer going forward. Because without security, everything else falls flat. Uh, absolutely. You know, on his face. Yeah. Um, Dr. Tokwe Faswa there. Yes, but uh, we must commend the Nigerian military. They are doing a real great job uh, regaining mm. and reclaiming, you know, yeah. Nigeria's uh, territories yeah. and decimating uh, those bandits and terrorists day in, day out. So we'll get it right. Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Dr. Dr. Tokwe Faswa, the economist and chartered accountant uh, here in Abuja studio, and Professor Bongo Adi in Lagos.